Thanks very much, Lucinda. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this special session on international law and the Trump administration um, with a focus on national and international security. The Center for International Governance Innovation is a nonpartisan independent think tank uh, focused on global governance and law, politics, security, and economics. We're based in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, and um, we have fellows all around the world. And we, what we focus on is writing and preparing policy-relevant research on critical issues of international law, mainly focusing on international economic law, environmental law, intellectual property law, and indigenous law. Now, um, Canadians have two expressions about America that I'm sure you've heard before and will uh, be very familiar to Canadians. Uh, when America sneezes, Canada and the rest of the world catches a cold. And the other one was by um, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who was the, uh, an, an earlier Prime Minister of Canada, he said, living next to you, America, is in some ways like sleeping with an elephant. No matter how friendly and even-tempered is the beast, if I can call it that, one is affected by every twitch, I would add it tweet, and grunt. So that's why we're interested in, um, in sponsoring this event. I think that um, we, watch, we watch what happens in the US um, with great interest. How US presidents and indeed all national leaders treat international law is a vital aspect of our collective peace, security and prosperity. Um, their relationship to international law either lends legitimacy to it or takes it away. And nowhere is this more important than in the uh, very contested area of national security and international security. So I hope you enjoy this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ona. There, there's a similar saying in Mexico about colds and sneezes, so maybe they got it from the Canadians. Let me now turn the panel over to Benjamin Wittes to introduce, uh, who will be our moderator, and he'll introduce the remainder of the panelists and the topic. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you. So um, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't begin this panel by just pausing for a moment over the name of it, which is International Law and the Trump Administration. And if, if that doesn't uh, bring a smile to your lips in, in some form, uh, I, I think you know, we may as well pack up and go home. Um, so I, I'm actually going to be very, very brief with the introductions because I want to use as much time uh, for a conversation here as we can and to involve you guys in it. Uh, so what we're going to do, the order of operations here is that we're going to go left to right here, uh, give very brief uh, opening remarks, uh, and then we will uh, start a conversation up here. And, and uh, as you guys have questions, there are mics uh, on the side. I can't see you very well because of the brightness of the lights. So, you know, if, if you're up there and I'm not calling on you, you know, uh, make florid movements with your hands or something. Uh, so with us today are Shireen Hunter of the Georgetown uh, School of Foreign Service, uh, John Bellinger, who was uh, uh, a State Department legal advisor in the Bush administration, now uh, of Arnold and Porter, and Elisa Massimino, who uh, uh, runs Human Rights First. Uh, and uh, let's start with Shireen. Just give us your thoughts. Well, um, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, actually, I have to have a disclaimer. I am not a lawyer, and uh, actually, well, probably the reason why I'm here is to provide a dose of political uh, realism uh, and, uh, and, and to really show a little bit uh, still the limits of uh, um, uh, international law, uh, to what extent actually international law governs uh, international relations and why. 
Um, to begin with, one thing we have to understand that law does not have any existence outside of society and communities. And, uh, you know, in other words, law is not something that is out there and it's not related to the social and political conditions and processes that's going on. Um, and uh, generally also laws are uh, outcome of uh, two basic processes. Uh, Either laws are over time, long time, over a long time, or the outcome of uh, uh, political uh, struggles and political compromises. And, uh, and it's when there is a sufficient consensus within a society uh, and that everybody is willing to give up uh, some of their privileges for independent action for the greater good, for greater security, and so on and so forth, then we have uh, a society that develops laws and also uh, creates mechanisms that uh, to uh, um, guarantee the enforcement of those laws. So the one other thing that is very important to keep in mind is the enforcement mechanism. Uh, who is going to enforce laws? I mean, in let's say that in national uh, societies, is the police or the military or, 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 or whatever. So I think this, these are two things that we have to understand. Laws are outcome of certain social and political processes, unless, of course, you know, we believe in divine law or natural law and certain things, those are a different category of, of law. Um, but when we come to international law, of course, you know, the development of international law has a very long history. Uh, it, there has always been certain laws that uh, have governed uh, um, relations among states. Where, for instance, certain things that governing the rules of war and, and, you know, or ceasefires and so on, even in ancient times, or even that, um, you know, states are responsible for the safety of immigrants envoys and, and so on. So if, if, let's say that in the old days an envoy was not treated well and or was killed, that would have been a casus belli. It could have left. So there has always been international law. But if you really want to look at uh, the beginnings of international law, it's very interesting that the beginning of international law, and if we take Hugo Grotius, who talked about of, um, law of peace and war, that was more or less also the same time that we see the state system is coming into being in, in, in Europe, or the so-called, the, uh, the, 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 on the basis of the so-called the Treaty of Westphalia, that laid down a number of principles, including, for example, non-interference in internal affairs of other states and so on. And so, after, since then, because of expansion of international relations, we have also seen uh, that uh, the number of uh, uh, various types of laws have been developed. Um, and actually, the overwhelming uh, part of these laws that relates to the um, regulation and management of uh, various exchanges among uh, nations and societies and so on are observed by everybody. For example, nobody, the, you know, we, we think that, you know, like mail comes and goes, of course, nowadays with emails, this is another uh, difficulty. I don't know how that's going to be. But when the, you know, all the um, mail comes and goes and even at time of war and nobody interferes with, with that and, you know, all these things is regulated under the the you know, International Postal Union, for example, or uh, when you have the maritime law, for instance, uh, basically is functions pretty well. And all the, uh, what I call is that functional things is essentially not very contested and everybody or aviation laws and so on and so forth. So that part of international law, actually, I think because there is common interest, the, the, the best important guarantor that inter, international laws are going to be implemented and observed is a commonality of interest. And in this regard, there's much broader commonality and interest, and everybody is convinced that it's in their own interest to observe this law. Where we get into the trouble, it becomes when matters are related to much more uh, areas, uh, important areas where there is no commonality of interest. And of course, we come into the question of uh, uh, security, the, the matters of uh, um, peace and war, 
and and you know and that, that is where the, the problem becomes and that in those regards we really don't have a commonality of interest and that is something that uh, you know when i was growing up I went to university. Those days, we used to think about world peace through world law, you know, and members of United Nations associations and so on. And it is very sad that now that I am at much more advanced age, that to see that we actually have have regrets. But that is that is the uh, the problem that in the international relations, actually, uh, more than. Um, Law is really power that uh, is, and I think that international law, unfortunately, is mostly um, uh, is breached, is, is not absorbed. If somebody has the power uh, uh, to disregard uh, uh, the law, it will, and I don't think that international, I can give you examples. I mean, we uh, obviously, now we have a lot of problems going on in the Middle East and other parts of the world. Uh, but I think that, uh, uh, and so the focus very naturally is on the Trump administration. But if you look at the uh, previous administrations as well, uh, there were a number of unilateral uh, actions that have been taken with frankly very flimsy uh, a legal justification for it. And um, since I also served for a uh, long time as a delegate in the United Nations, I saw how the UN uh, things uh, um, done. And in fact, what really reflects also that international relations, unfortunately, are still, no matter what people say, are still based on power. And it basically, if you have the power and you can do it and get away with it, you do it. And so the only thing that could deter is a countervailing power. I may be, you know, they, some people might say that, yes, I know, I will wrap up, uh, that uh, I am a cynical realist. I'm not cynical at all, but that is a fact of life. For example, uh, we have had the use of chemical weapons, for example, in the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, nobody, there was not a peep uh, from anybody in Saddam Hussein was not attacked. Saudi Arabia is using cluster bombs, which are equally bad, but Nobody is bombing, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia. So it's also even in defining uh, what is a breach of international law. Uh, you know, there is a lot of, uh, I would say, that um, uh, gray, well, not to me, there is no gray area. But the fact of it is that the international community does not have an enforcement mechanism. <laughs> And that uh, and, and when you look at and that nobody else is going to um, force it, particularly the great powers. If you look at United Nations, why do you think that they have the veto power? The veto power was imposed because they realized after the uh, defeat of the League of Nations uh, that you cannot uh, force big powers uh, to do something they don't want. And so in the UN uh, Charter, they decided to put that. So finally, what I'm trying to say is that this is a, fast, uh, you know, a, a very sad fact that international law is often used um, uh, you know, against the countries basically that don't have any way of you know, responding. And that basically big powers uh, you know, don't uh, uh, observe at all uh, international law. The application of international law is very, um, is very uh, sort of skewed, and it's really based on what I mean. Russians go and take over Crimea, and nobody can do basically anything because you don't want to start a nuclear war with Russia, or somebody, you know, Sarkozy goes and bombs Libya. Uh, you know, you're not going to start a war with France. Um, so I would just stop that, but basically to give you the idea that there is the ideal of law that we want as an international community to reach a point where actually laws will be observed and will be implemented, but the reality that currently is that unfortunately international relations are still in the national security area are still chaotic and you know, essentially, it is they are determined by the by power and by various balances of power. Thank you. Sorry if I was a bit longer. No, no, don't be silly, John. Uh, 
Great, thanks, Ben. So, well, we have a fantastic moderator who knows more about this subject than any of us, so I'm gonna try to be brief and let Ben ask us some questions. Let me start, uh, as I know Ben would like us to, by being, trying to be provocative to say, obviously, on the one hand, uh, candidate Trump and then President Trump for the first three months have done a number of extraordinarily alarming and troubling things for those of us who are concerned about international law. Uh, uh, but there may be some rays of hope uh, and the question is, you know, where will those rays of hope go? So let me decompact that. Um, oh, I've been, I think as most of you know, very concerned about President Trump as a candidate all along. As Ben knows, I wrote one of the earliest uh, posts on lawfare in November 2015, not 2016, that said that Donald Trump is a danger to our national security based on statements that he had made about uh, uh, returning to waterboarding, killing the family members uh, of terrorists. Uh, it troubled me when he said, who were those eggheads who had negotiated the Geneva Conventions? And I felt that he was really dividing us as a country, as a candidate. Uh, as many of you know, that then blossomed into the letter that I wrote on behalf of the 50 national security officials in August uh, last year uh, that said that Donald Trump is not qualified to be president. Uh, he lacks the qualifications, experience, and values to be president and would be reckless and dangerous. Uh, and, you know, I have remained concerned in the first couple of months of this administration about things that he has done, many things that we're all well aware of, such as the executive order on immigration, smaller things that you may not have seen, which just struck me as, as bizarre, his statement that we should have taken the oil in Iraq and maybe we still will. Uh, uh, and then when challenged on that, he said, what international law experts say that's wrong? So, uh, you know, there he continues to say these unusual things. Uh, there were the draft executive orders that came out in the very beginning, which I'd like to talk a little bit about. Some of them didn't come out, like the one on multilateral treaties, the one on defunding the UN. Uh, the one on resuming the CIA programs, but it gives you a sense of where President Trump's advisors are, uh, and those are obviously concerning things. We've seen uh, a potential return to some of the troubling counterterrorism policies that I know Elisa will talk about. The Attorney General has talked about reopening Guantanamo. Uh, so there's a lot to be alarmed and concerned about. The question will be, is this administration going to begin to settle down uh, when more officials get into place? Uh, the one, one ray of hope that I do see is that I think there are some serious lawyers who are going into positions in this administration. Uh, uh, centrist, non-ideological lawyers uh, uh, who uh, I hope once they get into these positions will help to uh, educate uh, the president and some of his advisors on uh, the importance of international law uh, and, uh, and uh, international institutions. Uh, uh, I have a sense of who the legal advisor may be, uh, uh, but, uh, and I think it is someone, if we head in this direction, that people will be comfortable with. And uh, uh, John Sullivan had been uh, named to be general counsel uh, at DOD. He's a very serious centrist lawyer. Uh, they pulled his nomination to make him deputy secretary of state. Somewhat unusual appointment, but he's highly qualified. Uh, so my hope is uh, that with some of these serious people in place uh, that the administration may begin to settle down. The National Security Council in utter disarray in the beginning is beginning to settle down. Uh, I don't know what direction this is all going to head. It could continue uh, in the first direction of alarm and troubling, uh, but it may, uh, if we get some of these more serious people in place, particularly the lawyers, it may begin to settle down after a while. So I think it honestly is, there is cause for alarm, uh, uh, but it is uh, too early to tell yet. Excellent, Lisa? Okay, uh, thanks Ben, uh, and uh, uh, it's really a honor to be here. I wanted to also say a special thank you to Sara Mohammed for organizing this panel. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here. It takes a special kind of person. I don't know what it says about you that you leave a beautiful spring day like it is today and come into a cold, dark basement to talk about international law. Um, <laughs> but good on you. Uh, uh, so 
Uh, we're not even to 100 days yet, right? I don't think we are, not quite. It feels like 100 years to some of us, but, uh, uh, but there's already been a lot of ink spilt about what does this um, America First uh, policy really mean. We have the task today to talk about whether international law has been posed at, at the very beginning. Is it even relevant? Is it on the radar screen and factoring into the administration's calculus? <coughs> when it's facing international and domestic security issues. The conventional thinking is that America first means, you know, that it's it's kind of code for a form of populist isolationism approach that seeks to avoid anything that smacks of globalism. Uh, and, you know, it remains to be seen whether the Syria strike, strikes are a, a, a counterexample to that. Um, but the early signals are uh, that, you know, with the, silence on human, um, we just saw in the New York Times today that Secretary Tillerson in his um, meetings in Russia, not only did he not meet with any human rights activists or opposition leaders, but didn't raise human rights at all. Um, this preference for a transactional approach to foreign affairs rather than a relationship-based approach or values-based approach, um, the focus on you know the hard elements of security and the proposal of this hard power budget that would essentially gut the ability of the United States and the UN to um, promote uh, adherence to international law and human rights obligations. Um, all of that, I would say, uh, coming from a perspective as I do that the respect for human rights is the foundation of peace and security in the world. Um, all of that poses a, a, a threat to international uh, security and, and domestic uh, national security. And as John mentioned, the tone for all of this was set in the campaign with this advocacy by, by uh, candidate Trump for a return, return to torture and the war crimes. And he brought that rhetoric into the White House. You know, he continues to say that, um, that torture works and it's a good idea, but he's going to hold off on it because Secretary Mattis um, would rather use cigarettes and um, in a chat. So, um, so the that creates a lot of concern. How the president thinks about these issues, and as John said, whether there are going to be uh, personnel that constrain and advise uh, and steer that into um, into a, a more traditional respect for international law. Structurally, I just want to note. Um, you know, there are things going on below the surface, some may be good, some not so good. Uh, there's uh, been a restructuring, as you know, of the National Security Council, but there was also a renaming and likely a repurposing of what used to be the Human Rights and Multilateral Affairs Office at the NSC. So, and the U.S. is, uh, of course, everyone has heard the rumors that they're threatening to withdraw from the Human Rights Council at the United Nations. Um, and as I said, the budget proposal speaks volumes about what uh, this administration thinks about commitment to international uh, law and international norms. The executive orders, again, that John mentioned, those are of huge concern to us, um, and, uh, especially the, uh, the so-called travel ban and the suspension of uh, resettlement of refugees. Those mark a dramatic retreat uh, from uh, American ideals. And as I think are a real security threat. As numerous uh, national security expert, experts from uh, both parties have said, abandonment of American leadership on uh, refugee protection uh, during a, the worst refugee crisis since World War II poses a significant threat uh, to national security um, and to our allies in the region and in Europe. Um, so these these things all implicate uh, global uh, security and our domestic security. Um, we're looking at now, I, I don't know if you saw the uh, announcement by Attorney General Sessions at the border the other day of increased prosecutions um, for so-called illegal entry without any recognition at all that, um, that uh, the U.S. is committed not to punish refugees seeking asylum for their manner of entry. Um, so this is not a brand new thing. Uh, for the United States, certainly the Obama administration was uh, using detention as a deterrent for refugees uh, seeking asylum here. Um, but this professed new era, uh, the Trump era of enforcement on uh, immigration, 
uh, poses a lot of challenges for commitment to international law. You've got the comments about, well, Guantanamo is still open, so but reopening it for business, moving new people into Guantanamo, the increase in civilian casualties at the same time that we're hearing that that the administration is looking to reevaluate the rules about targeting. Um, all of these things pose uh, real concerns for those of us who care about adherence to international law and even more importantly uh, to our national security. So I'll leave it there and we'll have a discussion. Excellent. Thank you, Elisa. Um, so I want to, I, I actually love John's formulation of two baskets, the troubling and alarming and the rays of hope as a kind of rubric for this discussion. But I want to, and I'm going to return to that in a moment, but I want to start with uh, the last week and a half uh, in which the president went from, and the secretary of state went from uh, a, a policy of benign neglect toward uh, Bashar Assad, <coughs> despite uh, uh, repeated uh, uh, um, atrocities involving large numbers of civilians, uh, up to and including the use of chemical weapons, to frankly, the president sounded a bit like Human Rights Watch the other day uh, in talking about uh, Assad. Um, and really came close to uh, asserting that we had acted in order to enforce a norm against the ban on chemical weapons, uh, and it seemed to include barrel bombs in that. So seemed to be talking on the basis of an international law justification for what he did uh, that was kind of rooted in humanitarian protection. On the other hand, the action that he took was, uh, you know, uh, shall we say, weakly predicated in international law. Um, and so my question, and I'll just throw this open to the panel, is, is this a good week for international law in, with respect to the Trump administration on the grounds that we are now apparently, in, you know, enforcing humanitarian protections, or a bad week on the fact that we, 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 we just took military action that can only be very weakly or maybe not at all uh, supported with reference to the charter. Can I get you Please, that? please. Well, I really, I'm sorry if I um, present myself. It seems to me that um, the whole question of humanitarian protection, uh, which uh, was, it's a, it's a very new thing, you know, when you, it's a post, uh, Cold War, post-Soviet uh, phenomenon. Um, and that is that essentially, uh, it, to me, it is a, it, a very, very cynical uh, a justification for intervention because uh, there are many other places that a lot more was going on that there was no humanitarian uh, protection. Bernard Kushner, uh, uh, the, the one-time French uh, uh, minister of uh, culture, uh, brought uh, this out. Uh, and it was, frankly, to me, a new uh, version of the uh, civilizing mission, mission civilisatrice. We go and colonize because we want to civilize them and bring them all the... And humanitarian protection became that. And I think if you really want to see that uh, humanitarian intervention has caused more uh, problems than if they hadn't. For example, Gaddafi might have killed another two, three thousand people. But look what has happened in Libya after the humanitarian intervention by France and the NATO countries. Uh, we went to humanitarian intervention in Iraq. Now you have four million uh, uh, Iraqi orphans. Uh, and so this is what I'm trying to say. And, and of course, this, I know it by experience, being in international organizations, uh, is that all this actually international, this type of international law is actually is a smokescreen for a far more 
uh, intervention by by powerful countries. Um, I think that so, you know. So, so can I just clarify? So, so what I'm so, saying is that we don't even know whether actually Assad used the chemical weapons or not. I'm not going to defend Assad, please, by no means. But what I'm saying is that there has to be, if you want to go by international law before you attack, you have to have an international committee or something to go and actually ascertain. Even in the 2013, there was some uh, doubt that whether it was the rebels who were using the chemical weapons or it was that. And who is arming the, the thing? Is this, is, does actually international law allow arming of rebels by other outside countries? It doesn't. It goes against the principle of non-intervention. Now, admittedly, there is a conflict, an ethical conflict. Uh, you know, the principle of uh, sovereignty clashes with the principle of humanitarian support. But the point I'm trying to say is that the debate on this kind of international law, and particularly humanitarian intervention, is not very rigorous. Okay, so we have a strong formulation here of the bad week for international law yes, thesis. Yes. Uh, do either of you want to sign? Uh, yes. Want to stand up for the idea that actually this is more in the good week side or mixed week? I'm going to continue my theme of saying I think it's too early to tell. I think this is mixed. He, the he, the president may have recklessly gotten to the right place. Uh, uh, and the question is: Is this the is this a is a emblematic of a reckless president uh, and that we ought to be concerned about, uh, or has he gotten to the right place and that this shows, in fact, that uh, he is going to adopt policies that are appropriate? So, so it's a I, troubling and alarming ray of hope. Uh, I, maybe, <laughs> maybe so. So, look, uh, you know, I as a matter of international law. All, all of us know this cannot be uh, uh, said to be legal under international law. The question is, is it justified as a matter of international law? Do we go with the Kosovo factors? Uh, or I actually, I was just saying to Mark on this, I agree with Harold Coe on this. I think the, there should be an emerging and evolving norm uh, for intervention in such cases, even though international law does not recognize that right now. Uh, the question here is, does Donald Trump even care or look at any of these legal issues? Were there lawyers involved in any of these decisions at all? In the picture down in Mar-a-Lago, there was not a lawyer in the room. Now, again, maybe that's because they were all off at a hotel in Florida, uh, but there was no lawyer in the room. All of the National Security Council meetings that I have ever been in and that I saw pictures of in the Obama administration, you had the NSC legal advisor, you had the counsel to the president there in the room. So the question is, did international law inform these decisions uh, at all? I, you know, I do not think this can be said to be legal, but it, we, it may still have been the right thing to do. Uh, uh, to uh, to smack the Syrians back. I do think the Syrians did this. I do not want to have waited for months and months and months to have tried to figure out who did this. And I think that it was probably the appropriate policy. I am concerned that there was not law that was injected into this decision making. Uh, and I hope that it's not too late. I have called uh, repeatedly for the Trump administration to come out and explain if not the legal basis, because I don't think there's a clear one, at least what the legal justification is for that. And I'm sure that L uh, is the, the L lawyers are urging that both on the Secretary of State and on the Council of the President. And I hope that we will see more of that. Okay, Elisa, yep. it's all you. Good, good week or bad week? <laughs> well, here's Troubling a, and alarming, yeah. rare of hope or yeah. both? Well, here's one way it, we could turn it into a good week, which would be if this tension that arises every time this conflict comes up between the constraints of international law uh, and the um, imperative also that is in the UN Charter, um, that respect for human rights is the foundation of peace and security in the world. If, it prompt, if, if this action by the uh, Trump administration prompts all of us as international lawyers to actually engage on this question and start to put forward ideas about where how we're going to resolve this tension instead of just putting our heads in the sand, that would make it a good week for international law. Um, 
But, you know, it's hard to uh, not celebrate an attempt to enforce the prohibition on the use of chemical weapons. I mean, that, that, that is an instinct that we want to uh, embrace, I think. But uh, launching missiles is not a strategy. And I think, you know, again, to, to turn it from a, a troubling ray of hope uh, to a good week for international law and for human rights would be if the administration would also uh, not only lay out its legal justification, <coughs> excuse me, but um, but would recognize that um, the United, if the United States wants to play a leading role on this, um, that it should be taking steps to ensure accountability for the uh, violators of this uh, important international norm, and at the very, very least, drop this horrendous ban on the resettlement of refugees and increase the number of refugees from Syria that we take into the United States. That would be real leadership. So I want to focus, before we turn to the rays of hope, because we're in a dark room, we should focus on the, on the troubling and alarming first. Um, but I, I want to go back to the president's statements. Um, and, you know, John started his remarks by focusing on a bunch of things that the president, when he was campaigning, had said about our obligations and uh, his lack of regard for them. Uh, he's said a number of not quite as outrageous, but almost as outrageous things since he's taken office. And he does seem to have, uh, you, you know, a lack of filter between him and his fingertips with respect to the Twitter feed. Um, and so my, the, uh, my first question on this is, what does this do to, you know, the sort of a pineo juris of the United States when the president is constantly raising questions about, uh, you know, whether we will in fact observe obligations that we've always accepted as legally binding. Um, and, you know, just, get, uh, just you know, start with Elisa and go down the row. How disruptive is this and what are the areas that you're kind of particularly concerned about disruption? Uh, it's a big deal, and we're really concerned. Uh, you know, I, I think as John's ray of hope is that there are going to be people filling in around, you know, in in uh, in the administration as it staffs up that will help, you know, actually either put the brakes on these kinds of um, radical departures that come out from the president, um, uh, or are really that's where the business of um, diplomacy and law gets done is at that level. Um, but, you know, when you've got a, a, a president sowing chaos, especially, you know, with our, um, well, with everybody, allies and enemies alike, um, you know, I don't think that it was an accident that that chemical weapons attack happened shortly after um, you know, the administration made clear that we're really not that going to be that interested in what happens with Assad in Syria. So um, those kinds of pronouncements from the top have a big impact. Um, they give uh, CC in Egypt a, a kind of green light when we say you're doing a great job and welcome to the White House. Um, those, those kinds of things, particularly in the absence of the you know, kind of the hard work of uh, of international relations done by uh, American bureaucrats and diplomats um, have a real impact on people's lives and on security. So those kinds of things, on uh, particularly on uh, the impact on our adversaries, that that can be really profound, um, and it's hard to wind that back. Uh, and on our allies, also, I think that. Uh, you know, when they're, particularly right now with Europe, where there is a clear kind of political battle for the soul of democratic values and ideals in Europe, in a lot of countries, uh, the signal that we don't care so much about those things anymore, now we're back on the track that NATO's important, but, you know, there's, uh, who knows if that's going to change again, depending on who's in the, you know, who meets with the president. Um, those kinds of things, uh, can have a very damaging uh, impact on 
the calculations that our allies make about their own commitment to international norms. So I, I think that kind of thing is really important. I mean, we saw uh, in previous administrations how, um, you know, you can have laws in place, uh, prohibiting torture, for example, but if you've got somebody at the very top or close to the very top sending a message that this kind of stuff is okay, um, that, you know, goes down the chain of command like a stone. Uh, to the very bottom, that message gets sent. So the impact is, I think, profound globally and also uh, domestically. John? Uh, well, I just say I, I agree with Elisa on this. I mean, these were the concerns that I raised in the campaign. It wasn't just that I was concerned about things that Trump you know, said that that he would do, but that what he was saying during the campaign was, in fact, dividing the country at the time. Uh, so that he w he would not only make things worse as president, but he had made things worse already, and I have continued to see that it's it's extremely destabilizing around the world uh, for the president to say that uh, that he does not believe in uh, our international obligations or international law, uh, and that uh, he doesn't understand why the Geneva Conventions were negotiated, and uh, you know who would say we couldn't take the oil from Iraq? I mean, this is obviously very destabilizing uh, to everybody. Uh, uh, and and a couple things. One, he will find that it will make it much harder for him to be president because people then will not trust him when he tells them things later on. Uh, second, uh, on human rights, of course, the United States has always stood for a uh, rules-based system, a values-based system, commitment to human rights, and when the president himself is suggesting that the United States uh, no longer believes that, and sadly, uh, that some chunk of the population believe that as well, then the United States really suffers uh, internationally. Uh, it makes it much harder for the government uh, and for uh, groups like Human Rights First to do their jobs. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for the new Assistant Secretary of Democracy and Human Rights uh, at the State Department uh, to raise these issues with other countries. Maybe so, so it's very, it is very concerning. Uh, <coughs> what I have to just hope will happen uh, is that as officials come into place and try to educate the president and his advisors, apparently the way General Mattis did with the president, uh, that he will see, perhaps grudgingly, uh, the other side of these arguments, why we uh, believe in international law, why we believe in human rights. Uh, and you see this at the be beginning of every administration with every president, uh, that they don't see the arguments uh, on the other side. And we'll just have to hope that despite the things the president has already said and the destabilization that's already happened, uh, that we can try to get him to settle down. Let me, let me just push you uh, on one aspect of that, um, which is, you know, you identified one concrete consequence of, of the destabilization, which is that the president will have a harder time getting people to believe him and doing business. Uh, what are the others? I mean, when, when you think about it, if you put yourself back in your L role, and you have the president constantly, both as candidate and as president, raising questions about wh whether we will observe our legal obligations. How does that make I, either your job harder or worse yet, if you put yourself in the comparable role of some foreign legal advisor, what opportunities or, or negative opportunities does that create for you? I think what may happen is that there will end up just being a sort of a disconnect between the president and the rest of the officials in the government. I mean, we are already seeing that just at the cabinet secretary level when the president is tweeting some things and Mattis as, and, 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 and Kelly and others and Tillerson are going around the world saying something almost completely different on assuring and soothing allies. And I think when we get... Uh, deputy secretaries, undersecretaries, assistant secretaries in place, uh, and some many of these people I hope will have government experience, uh, that you know, they will be sending a much different message to foreign governments as they negotiate agreements. But it obviously makes it then a lot harder 
uh, as one is trying to negotiate something with another country or in Elisa's world to be pushing another country on human rights uh, if the man at the top is saying something different. Yeah, I mean, we, we should, we might find that we're, you know, nostalgic for the days where all we had to worry about was hypocrisy on human rights. <laughs> Well, if you're on all sides of all issues, you can't be hypocritical. <laughs> Shireen? Yes. Well, I, I just, uh, to be honest, I don't want to focus uh, too much on Trump administration because um, it, many of the things that we are complaining about, and it is true, I mean, let's face it, Trump did not uh, initiate waterboarding. I mean, these are the things Guantanamo was done under the uh, uh, George W. Bush administration. I mean, I'm sorry, I have many, many reservations about uh, President Trump, but I'm just trying to be more, not focus so much of an individual, but look at it as a phenomenon <laughs> rather than. Uh, so uh, President Bush started the waterboarding and so on. Um, unilateral intervention, President Reagan invading Grenada, not giving any concern, even though Grenada was a small, it, that was a distraction, um, you know, for domestic purposes and so on. But that is the behavior that unfortunately has been going on. And the other thing on the human rights, I think that if one thing I learned from my years of serving at the United Nations uh, Committee on Human Rights uh, is the hypocrisy of human rights. And, and the certain things, for example, we helped to try to get rid of Assad uh, because we thought that uh, the human rights of the Syrians, for example, for, they didn't have democracy. And now we have four million, uh, Syria is devastated, uh, and we have four million more uh, Syrian refugees. European societies cannot take all these refugees. I also served at the human rights, uh, at the uh, UN as a delegate at the UN High Commission for Human Rights. So I'm not a refugee. I'm, I'm not just saying this from a sort of an academic perch. I have seen it. I was a, more or less a refugee and a non-documented person. So I, I have actually experienced these things. But the fact of the matter is that there's an incredible hypocrisy about human rights. I mean, look, for example, the Bahraini government literally is trying to commit gradually through a change of population a sort of a genocide. It's not just gassing or whatever, it is basically bringing Pakistanis and giving them, and we are selling them all kinds of bombs and, and, and so on. So I, I think that, and this was the Obama administration did it, Clinton administration did many things. They went and bombed, the, uh, you know, chem, uh, whatever, it was like a, uh, a drug factory in Sudan because we were unhappy uh, about that. So I have to be honest with you, I have become very much concerned about the abuse of human rights thing. In fact, the, the uh, interventions on the basis of uh, enforcing human rights leads to greater uh, uh, um, a greater uh, disregard for human rights. The biggest right, human rights, is right to life. When you are killed, doesn't matter whether you have political rights or not. I mean, this is also intellectually has been argued in, uh, uh, in many, many uh, things. So, I mean, for example, in Syria, Syria now is not a question about this. Syria now has become a test case. Who is going to be the hegemon of the region? And there are everybody, both regional level for that and international level for that. And so that uh, the whole question of Assad staying or going and uh, whatever, Assad is, a, Assad is a tool. If the Russians and Americans cut a deal tomorrow, Assad will be gone. But, but they cannot agree what kind of a post-Assad uh, thing. So what I'm saying in here is that... Um, Law is all very important, but unfortunately, it's politics that defines things, including in internal societies. For example, and, and laws change because if the values of society change. You look at the United States itself, since the, some 40 years I've been living here, a lot of things have changed, and, and eventually they are not reflected in laws. So I'm just trying to see that we cannot, the deification of law and abstract of law is different. The other thing that you were saying that you said, John, that is uh, international law. What you said, it is ethics. And there is a major difference between ethics and law. 
Of course, ethics should constitute the foundation of law, uh, oftentimes. But, but law by itself is not. There are unjust laws as well uh, that, you know, people uh, go. So I'm, I'm trying to say is that internationally, all these things, everybody to one level or another disregards international law. You look at the number of United Nations resolutions that nobody, Security Council resolutions, not General Assembly, because General Assembly resolution has no weight whatsoever, that nobody applies. They don't. They go and do everything. I can give you many, many examples. So I think that, uh, um, yes, President uh, uh, Trump should be uh, kept, you know, his toes to the fire <laughs> and so that he doesn't disregard particularly treaty obligations. Treaty obligations are very important um, unless they then renegotiate. Treaties are renegotiated. They don't last forever and ever. It's not the God's covenant, you know. Um, so I think that, if, but, but you do it in a proper way. Um, but, okay. but let's understand the reality of law and, and the political context within which law operates. Okay, so we're going to go to audience questions uh, shortly. So as you have questions, uh, please go to the mics. Um, I've got a couple more before we do, but uh, uh, Elisa, you, you wanted to respond. Well, I just, I wanted to go back and reinforce the question that you asked, Ben, about, you know, what are the concrete costs uh, of this kind of approach? And, you know, uh, John has said this many times, you know, the extent to which the U.S. views um, international law is some annoying hurdle to, you know, kind of, or some some T to cross or I to dot, um, that has a direct relationship to uh, our ability to lead globally and our uh, national security. It's really, uh, it, you know, it's ironic. I, I was listening to, at lunch yesterday, um, to uh, um, Lord Goldsmith about, you know, the impact of Brexit on sovereignty in the UK and everything. And it struck me, and he said, you know, it may turn out that, you know, this so-called reclamation of sovereignty turns out to be, um, you know, actually not not so great for sovereignty in the UK. Um, and it's here too, I think that, you know, this America first policy might end up really, um, because in part of this, uh, this approach to international law, to be America alone. Uh, not you know first, but all by itself, um, it it actually will weaken U.S. power to get the outcomes that we want globally. Because on all of these big problems, whether it's terrorism or climate or whatever it is, none of that stuff can be solved alone by the United States. Um, you know, Professor Hunter put it, the Trump uh, administration in the context of previous U.S. administrations that have also had their you know, ups and downs with international law. But I actually think it's it's more important to look at Trump in the context of what's going on globally. And, you know, it's more dangerous, I think, now because uh, the Trump administration is simil less similar to previous U.S. administrations um, and more similar to what we're seeing in many countries in Europe and, and in other places where there are these far-right nationalist populist parties that have this idea that throwing out the global order which ha they see as not serving them well is the way is the pathway to prosperity and security and I, I, I fear that it's the exact opposite so uh, one more question before we go to go to the audience um, <coughs> Sean Spicer made a remark the other day that, uh, you know, and again, what the status of a, of a White House press statement is these days is, a, is itself an interesting question. But he, he uh, raised the question of, you know, we, we have courts for these kinds of assessments, re referring to uh, uh, war crimes and whatnot. And so uh, this, of course, provoked a barrage on Twitter of, you know, has Trump just endorsed the ICC and will, you know, will we, will we be now signing the Rome Convention? Uh, so my question is, you know, um, where are we with respect to, you know, treaties, the ICC, 
the ICJ, sort of other institutions that the United States has been to one degree or another engaged with, uh, signatories to, um, or you know, kept at arm's length, uh, are, uh, how, how should we understand the Trump administration in relationship to those institutions and bodies? So why don't I, why don't I start with that? Because this is a, a sort of a perfect example of what I'm trying to say, which is uh, significant cause for alarm, uh, too early to tell, could go one direction or another in all sort of th all three of these. So let me take the ICJ and the ICC and a quick word on treaties. So the, the ICJ, obviously the United States has a case pending before the ICJ brought by Iran. Uh, we, uh, the administration has uh, suggested that it doesn't like international institutions. Uh, will, the United, will the Trump administration simply walk away from that case so that we have a repeat of Reagan and the Nicaragua case? Uh, will they do it in the middle? Uh, because we actually have very good jurisdictional arguments in that case, but if we lose on jurisdiction, will they then walk away? Uh, all, either of those two things would be ba very bad. Nothing has happened yet. Uh, it may depend heavily on who we get in as legal advisor and what Secretary Tillerson has to say, and it gets back to the point on education uh, to try to restrain the president's impulses that, well, we don't like international courts and tribunals, but to explain you know, why it's important for us to stay in the case. ICC, same thing. Uh, we could certainly see uh, a rollback to the uh, the first term of the Bush administration, uh, which really changed, as most of you know, pretty significantly in the second term of the Bush administration uh, uh, to a constructive uh, policy of engagement. Uh, and so, and there are in fact many conservatives in Congress that have supported the work of the ICC and have even provided rewards for justice to bring people to the ICC, such as the Lord's Resistance Army, in certain cases. So again, the education is going to be important for the president and his advisors. You could see an impulse that would immediately go back to declaring war on the ICC, ceasing assistance. There were some suggestions of that in the uh, draft executive order on the UN and international institutions. Cease assistance, go back to attacking. Uh, so we'll have to see what happens. And I'll just end on treaties because that's really one of my favorite uh, since this is one of the, the key roles of the legal advisor, if you didn't see it, you really should look at the, the draft uh, uh, executive order on treaties that was leaked back in uh, January, which is entitled Moratorium on New Multilateral Treaties, and which would have set up a cabinet-level committee uh, to uh, review uh, all all, all treaties, not just multilateral treaties, uh, to uh, recommend to the president which ones he should sign. That obviously was written by somebody who did not understand that the president actually doesn't sign most treaties, uh, uh, that they are signed by you know, other people like me. Um, and then to review all multilateral treaties to which we're a party and to determine which ones we should withdraw from. Uh, and the premise of this was uh, that the United States was a party to all sorts of treaties that were not in our interest uh, and that needed to be reviewed. Uh, but then there was a line that said, e except for treaties uh, that clearly relate to international matters. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you know, these impulses are, are written by people who do not understand that you know, the, the value of treaties, uh, the, the premise for this order uh, cites uh, two treaties to which the United States is not a party, CEDAW and the rights of the child, uh, uh, is suggesting that, well, there must be lots of other treaties to which previous administrations have secretly signed the United States up to <laughs> that are not in our interest and that do not relate to international matters, uh, uh, and that we need to carefully review them to determine which ones we should withdraw from and make sure certainly that the president doesn't sign any new ones. Uh, uh, fortunately, that was not, uh, did not come out. Maybe it will still come out, this executive order, but what we have got to hope uh, is that with new officials in place, 
they will explain uh, the value of many of these treaties. There are uh, at least a half a dozen or more multilateral treaties pending before the Senate right now that are very much in our interest, that are uh, uh, IP treaties uh, uh, and other business private international law treaties that are indisputably of value uh, uh, and that, that the administration ought to be supporting. So again, it all comes back to education and we'll have to see you know, what will happen. Yeah, and I think just to bring it back to us and this meeting, uh, the education also has to come from uh, all of us to the American public. Um, you know, I think that a draft order like the one John just outlined is clearly a, a kind of um, a, a gift to a political constituency uh, that, you know, responds to rhetoric from the campaign. We have to do a better job uh, just as, uh, you know, uh, uh, people inside the administration have to do a better job of educating uh, the White House about this. We, as a community, have to do a better job of making the case for why international law is relevant, important, and beneficial uh, in all of these areas that that John just described, whether it's, you know, from, from uh, business transactions to human rights. And we haven't done that. And that's why this is, uh, this kind of thing is a, you know, kind of political winner for someone like President Trump. So so we're, we're going to go to the floor. Uh, when you uh, uh, go to the microphone, uh, please uh, start by saying who you are, what organization you represent, <laughs> if there is one. And why don't you add an international treaty that you think the president should withdraw from because it's not in America's interest? Please. I think I'll pass on that last. <laughs> um, Diane I thought you might. <laughs> I'm at the University of Georgia School of Law. I'm also the special advisor to the International Criminal Court Prosecutor on Children, but I speak exclusively in my personal capacity, as do we all. Um, John, first of all, all of you, terrific panel. Really, really useful synthesis of a lot of what we've all been watching. Um, John, I'm with you on the two baskets, but my two baskets are troubling and alarming. <laughs> um, and you know, we see a lot happening. We see international law, we who know international law, see it cropping up all the time. And when I think about, uh, gosh, is it 10 or 15 years ago now, when many of us were equally concerned with um, developments that impacted international law. And, and I should add, my trouble and alarm as with many on the panel, extends well beyond the United States to what I see as a global emergence of anti-globalism, if you will, um, and the rule of law attendant to that. No, no, no. The last time around, we as lawyers knew our role. We started lawyering. We wrote briefs. Many of us were involved as amici, um, et cetera, um, sometimes as litigants uh, before the federal courts of the United States. And that is where we found change and success and adjustment. Not to say that other mechanisms are unimportant, but, but that central mechanism of the federal court of the United States was, I think, critical to that moment. We're now in a position, as you've said, where lawyers are not in the room. Women are not in the room. And the federal courts, with the exception of the travel ban, are not an easily uh, imaginable venue for, for dealing with a lot of these issues. So my question is, precisely what strategies would you recommend for those of us who want to put on pressure, see change, particularly those of us who are not the head of Human Rights First, those of us who are in our universities or elsewhere and unable to do amicus briefs because there's no lawyering going on. Okay. Can, uh, can I take a step yeah, yeah, that please. and actually echo? So, I mean, it is a, th that is the key question. Uh, and the uh, General Taguba, who Lisa will know, said to me a number of years ago uh, that you, you can, that there was an old saying in the army that you could not wring your hands and roll up your sleeves at the same time. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, there is, I completely with you, there is both cause for to be troubled and cause for alarm 
but we need to do something about it. We need to roll up our sleeves. Uh, and some of that is, in fact, uh, uh, litigating in court, such as the uh, travel ban. Uh, but s some of it is, in fact, trying to, and I really want to echo what Elisa had to say here and what the American Society is doing and what Mark and Lucinda are doing, which is to educate the American public. Uh, you know, actually, in some ways, all litigation is important, and I support it, and our firm does a lot of it. In some ways, that can make things worse to some portion of the American public because they think it's just being resisted. And I think I really want to make a call to arms to the law professors in the room to, you know, in your communities, you know, try to get out to explain the value of international law and institutions, not just to your own students, but to the Rotary Clubs. Uh, and, you know, accept every invitation. I try to do this myself. I mean, I am deeply concerned about it, and there is something that all of you can do besides just being alarmed and concerned and litigating, all of which are valuable things. But I think if each one of us, uh, you know, not just on the East Coast and the West Coast, but in the middle of the country can try to go out and explain, you know, the, the, you know, there are people who do not know that the reason that we, we can send letters is because of the International Postal Union or fly over other countries. Every, every time a Chicago plane takes convention. off. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it's important to, to be able to do these things. And frankly, and to support the people who are in government. Uh, you know, don't just criticize the people who go in if they are trying to do the right thing, you know, try to help them, try to try to educate them. I mean, Elisa was helpful to me when I was in government uh, by coming in and talking to me about concerns that Human Rights First had and to come up with, with helpful suggestions as best that she could. On the left, there are actually two banks of mics. So if you're, if you're closer to the one on the left uh, or to your right, go over there. And if you're closer to the one there, go over there. Thank you. I'm Mark Tiverbetic, and I'm with Woodrow Wilson Center in Gallaudet University. I'm not an international lawyer. I, I, I have PhD in international relations, but a lot of study of international law and appreciation for international law, and writing a book about the changing norms and how they influenced conflict management practices. So here is my question and comment and question, and I go back to what we were saying about Syria and the strikes. And my question to you is, I know it's uh, justified by as humanitarian intervention, but isn't it just a case of punishment? I wouldn't say reprisals because the United States hasn't been attacked, but simply punishment with the purpose of sending a message and increasing U.S. credibility um, uh, and um, um, shoring up the allies, reassuring the allies. Okay, and, let, let, yeah, let, great. And, I, and, is and, this just, this goes back to Shireen's question, is this just a, repri a, a punishment and reprisal? And if so, is there anything wrong with that? Well, I, first of all, I have to say, um, I look at it because that's my discipline. I am an international relations person. You know, I have had the experience in UN and places like that. The fact of the matter is, unfortunately, in my humble opinion, in my experience, ideals are generally at the service of power. Whatever it is, whether it's Al-Qaeda who says religion is this and so on, and my last book actually is on religion and international affairs, um, ideas have always been at the service of power. And, uh, and I think that this is, that this is a game going on as far as uh, uh, Syria is concerned, uh, which is a game going on at two levels for basically for hegemony. Whose uh, hegemony is going to prevail that? Um, America, Assad, the reason they wanted Assad to go is not because Assad is actually has a horrible humanitarian record. If, if, if that was the reason we should have bombed Syria in 2002, 2003, before even Assad's father was dead. But that is not about it. Assad has in the Middle East politics uh, in a side that we don't like and in a side that our allies don't like, whether it is Saudi Arabia, this and this. And so this is why Assad has become 
uh, sort of typhoid Mary. Um, and, and so I think that if, if we say this is as a real <laughs> politic operations, then I would say that this is justified. You know, it, it, as a real politic operation to shape the future politics and geopolitics of the Middle East and beyond, then this is justified. But to come and get on one's high horse and to say that this is in order to protect the Syrian children and Ivanka gets teary and so we bomb, uh, this actually, you know, the, the, if we had any concern for the Syrian thing, we would not have allowed our allies, uh, Turkey, Syria, this and that. And of course, other side is doing the same thing. So plague on both their houses. Uh, I've been arming all these people who have basically reduced Syria into rubble. So this is what I'm saying. It, this, is a, this is a real politics, cynical act of demonstration of power. A message, as every, a lot of people said, a message to Putin, a message to Iran, a message to North Korea, that, you know, be careful if you do anything, you are going to be bombed. And so the, the whole concept of international law, it just doesn't. International society is not run by law. The only laws that are, are the ones on the functional issues. But when it comes, everybody disregards international law. And they justify it. There is such a thing called casuistry. You know, you find a legal justification. Uh, uh, justification. I am a human rights person. As I said, in terms of refugees, you know, I, I was an undocumented person. And I realized how important it is to have a travel document. As a, <laughs> so I, I am aware of these things, and I wish that the world was run on that level. And I joined the colleagues here that the fact that the world is not run like that doesn't mean that it should remain so. And okay. so that, you know, one has to insist that it's changed. But at this point in time, no, this was the, this was the very cynical uh, power operation. Yeah, um, I understand that it's easy to be cynical about uh, um, why the administration did what it did on Syria. But I would caution against building our responses to those things on some interpretation of the motives of the administration. I, I would say that we look at what it does, what it says about what it does, and then put forward what we think should happen next. Um, so, you know, I think if, if we want to accept at face value that the president is concerned about uh, the extermination of children with sarin gas, then we ought to spell out what uh, what the United States ought to be doing about that next. Um, and I think that's a, it's, it's perhaps, what can you say, it's strategic optimism. All right, uh, so we have three people lined up. We have uh, 12 minutes, or now 11 minutes. Uh, so I will ask, uh, I'm going to ask uh, questioners, please keep your questions short and uh, emphatically in the form of a question. And I'm going to ask panelists, please keep your responses as brief as possible so that Sorry, we can sir. get to get to everybody. Sir. Ved Nanda, University of Denver Law School. So John, I don't come from the East Coast or the West Coast. So I'm in the middle. And I simply want you to know that it's not simply me, but faculty members around the country teaching international law, they do outreach. They do go to all these civic organizations, bar associations, and do try to convey the message that you have given. And I want to simply say one word to Professor Hunter before I ask a question. And that is Professor Hunter, the very first day teaching international law, I tell my students that international law does not act in a vi vacuum. Right. It's part of the international decision-making process. It's part of that political, booming, buzzing, confusing kind of world. Question. Question is, obviously, this day, with all that happened on Syria, we are all concerned, and so the focus has to be on these immediate issues. But I want to ask a question about national, international security, about climate change, and all that is happening at the present time with the Paris Accord. 
John, who are the people who are going to be educating Trump? And what is likely to happen about that issue, which is of utmost concern in terms of both national and international security, Paris Accord, some kind of agreement that people had raised. OK. Thank you. John? I, I, I take it your question to be, and thank you for the work that, that all of you are doing. So thank you for adding that. And I would just say, keep at it. I honestly think this is very important work that you all do. Um, I take it your question to be is, who is going to be advocating inside the administration on this? Uh, I think a lot of this will be initially the career people uh, who have worked on these treaties. Uh, I mean, it is interesting that President Trump, having said as a candidate uh, that uh, Paris was a terrible deal and he was going to tear it up, uh, uh, that uh, that he has not uh, taken any action. In fact, if anything, he has made some suggestions uh, that, uh, that he would not withdraw uh, from it. Of course, what is happening at EPA is a completely different issue and of, of, of huge concern. Uh, but my hope would be that the career officials inside the State Department, and then again as political officials will come in, uh, will explain the value uh, of remaining in these international agreements. And again, it, it is just simply interesting that in, in 100 days, nothing has happened yet. Uh, uh, particularly including what was potentially the nuclear option, which was to uh, not only back away from Paris, but to withdraw from the entire uh, UN framework. Sir? Yes, I'm Brian Leppard of the University of Nebraska College of Law. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the policy of the Trump administration on treaties, but of course there's another major source of international law, customary international law, and I was just wondering what impact do you believe that the Trump administration will have on existing norms of customary international law, but also the future development of customary law in light of evolving practice, obviously, as well as statements emanating from the government relating to Opino Juris, of course? Well, great question. I mean, I, one would, you know, as you well know, you know, Customary international law is a lightning rod for many conservatives. Uh, I w would be doubtful if President Trump knows what customary international law is. Uh, uh, I, you know, I would imagine that there will be political appointees in the administration who will be uh, concerned about uh, uh, customary international law uh, and will be resistant to some development of some norms. On the other hand, something like humanitarian intervention here, uh, you know, there may be, this may contribute to an emerging practice. Uh, uh, and again, I, I personally would prefer to see us, rather than simply uh, basing any intervention simply on factual factors to begin to lay out when the United States thinks that it is uh, actually justified and appropriate uh, uh, such that it becomes a, a customary international law norm in a very, very, very limited way, probably laid out like the, the British in their set of principles. Um, um, hard to know beyond that. Detention would be one possibility. Uh, you know, if we get in good general counsels at the Defense Department, uh, and the State Department, uh, uh, this could be, you know, there are in fact areas in the Geneva Conventions that are, where there are simply unanswered questions in uh, non-international armed conflicts. And since most of the conflicts that we're seeing right now are between states and non-states and there are not answers in some of the conventions, you could see with strong lawyers at defense and state, some development in, in those areas. You know, there could be resistance from other countries depending what direction that they take. But if they head in the right direction, perhaps led by the military and others, one could see, you know, potential useful useful development. So again, we'll have to see. Can I add one short? Please. If I have them. I just wanted to say one thing, and I hope I can be short. Basically, what we have seen happen uh, since the collapse of the USSR has been actually a regression 
as far as respect for international law is concerned. And this reflects, at, certainly during the first two uh, the decades after the collapse of the USSR, uh, the reason this has happened, an increase in basically American unilateralism, and then others, uh, uh, you know, uh, follow this, is because of the perception that the balance of global power uh, has changed so much that United States could do certain things without, uh, you know, basically any uh, consequences. I think that if the Soviet Union was in power, United States would not have invaded Iraq in 2003. And even in 1991, without Gorbachev policy of detente that basically did not want, this would not have happened. So this is where I'm coming that law and power had, we need a balance of power in order the international law to be respected. Now, there is one way that we can have an intervention, humanitarian and otherwise, which would be based on law. Because in United Nations, there is provisions for a UN army. And the reason that during the Cold War this didn't, it was that, you know, Americans and the Russians and others would not be able to work with. So if we want to have, for instance, humanitarian intervention, it should not be a single country or, or it should be an international force that actually does. And this will then prevent the manipulation of the so-called humanitarian intervention for purposes of power and prestige and whatever. Okay, ma'am. Uh, Jacqueline Peel, Melbourne University, Australia, one of the many allies that are puzzled by the inconsistent <laughs> diplomacy of President Trump. Um, we were talking about, you were talking on the panel about the concrete costs of uh, President Trump's approach to international law. And you mentioned, John, uh, sort of Trump being ignored on other issues or not being able to get traction or um, uh, Eliza, you were referring to America alone rather than America first. So I just wanted to ask the question, if that does play out in that way, who emerges potentially as another power to fill that gap? And in our region, we're particularly looking mm. to the role of China um, and with the South Sea uh, situation, we've seen China going ahead very much without any constraints being imposed by the Trump administration. So I'd be interested okay. in your thoughts on that question of whether mm. Trump's approach to international law opens up possibilities for other powers um, in this area. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, uh, so we have two minutes left. So let's uh, use this question as a, uh, as a wrap up and just each, uh, each of you give us a sense of who are the winners of, of Trump's mm -hmm. approach to international law. So uh, it's a great question. And I think, you know, again, this gets back to the education and we'll see if it changes. I, you know, my guess is that President Trump, because he was simply a, a businessman, did not realize and may, may still not realize, but I hope will come to realize just how respected the United States is in the world. Not in every issue. There's a lot of hypocrisy. It's not respected in a lot of, but there are many countries that look to the United States for leadership. Uh, and so when the United States withdraws, that does create a vacuum. Uh, I have heard, like you, that in Europe, that, that China is now everywhere uh, filling that void. Uh, 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 Europeans on their own are now, the EU will have to uh, exercise more leadership, although it has its own problems. Uh, but I do hope that the, uh, oh, I, I, I gave a lecture about this shortly after the election on Trump and the use of force on the need for the president to understand the value of his words uh, and the impact that those can have on other countries, that things that play well at home do not play well internationally and you know, prevent the US from exercising that uh, leadership role. And if I can just, since we're sort of making closing points, I wanna just mention one other thing that you may not know, particularly those who are not here in Washington, um, and it gets to the sort of the support of the people who are going into the administration. And, and Elisa may have a word on this, is that I, you know, not only do we need to support the career lawyers who are in a difficult position, many of whom are in the room right now, um, but not every political appointee who is going in uh, is you know, a, a longtime Trump believer. Uh, some may be, um, there may be people who are going in uh, for reasons of ambition uh, and don't really care what the president has said. Uh, but what I can tell you, because I have a lot of these conversations in Washington, as does Ben, 
and which is talked about at law fairs, there are a lot of people who are as troubled as you are, um, uh, but are still taking political positions because they believe that it is the best way to serve the country. Uh, and the thing to do is not to attack them. I see, you know, do not make their jobs more difficult. Try to support them in what they are doing because they are the ones who are really the best bastion against some of the concerns that you have. Shireen, final thoughts? Oh, I, 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 I will uh, hope and be very brief. Um, I think that um, we need to, uh, the most important thing is, in my humble opinion, we should not just look to one leader. You know, the whole notion of American leadership or Chinese leadership or Russian leadership and so on uh, is, is, in my humble opinion, is a little bit outdated. And, and if we really want to uh, create a law-based international society, uh, we have to create new mechanism for global decision making. And I think that United Nations, United States, uh, I think part of it is because other nations are coming up. No matter what Trump or George Bush or somebody else does, China is waking up. So, you know, Australia is going to feel the weight of China, even if we had Franklin Roosevelt, the president of the United States. And I think that in some respects, all these, uh, uh, you know, wars and things that U.S. has been involved with actually has sapped U.S. energy economy is in trouble, you know, and, and a lot of people in America are unhappy. So you cannot have a leadership role when a good uh, chunk of your population uh, is unhappy and feeling that the system has not worked for them, whether it's globalization, internationalization, uh, so whatever it is. So my bottom line is that don't to focus on Trump. Trump is a passing phenomena, but there are some basic shifts is happening internationally in international balance of economic and political power, and we need to come up with innovative ways of encouraging international cooperation and hence strengthening international law and respect for international ethics, which human rights and others come under that. Okay. Lisa, wrap us up. Really quickly, I, that's such an important question. Who's going to fill the void? We are in, I think, the most dangerous moment since World War II for the values-based, rules-based international order, the order which has largely kept the world at some level of, of peace and security um, since that time. And so I think that the, um, the challenge for all of us is to be making the case for the benefits of that rules-based uh, liberal international order, whether it's Orban in Hungary or Putin in Russia, um, China also. These, these countries are putting forward an alternative view of uh, how the world should work. And it does not include respect for rules, international human rights norms, um, it's antithetical to everything that this society stands for and that the United States has said that it stood for. So this is our moment as international lawyers. And uh, a lot is riding on whether we can rise to the occasion. With that, we're going to close. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel.